great. And I, that's exactly what I have. So, <laughs> right. You gotta Good. Have it All right. I think we're live. We're officially live. Woohoo. Right. Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Jump on board. We got a hot topic for y'all tonight. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to jump on board. I'm on the BeLive software. So as always, it gets a little cranky with me. So guys, give me a shout out in the comment section just so I can be sure uh, that the comments are working and rolling. I see a few people jumping on board this evening. All right. We're going to have a lot of people on board, I think, tonight. Got your game face on, Greg. Okay, I'm ready. I'm like, you're please ready. work. <laughs> Hey, Hearts. Yeah, okay. I'm like, uh, awesome. like, yeah. All right, we got Hearts Good. on yeah. board. Hearts are on. All right. All right, we got Julie. Hey, Julie, you're there. We got Glenda, Carl. How's it going? He's he's always signs off with Amp Life and Love. Love it, Carl. Love it. All right, we got Shauna on board. Yep. Very nice. Benny, Charles Hess. We got Steve Barrett from Prescott. Awesome. Hola. All Ooh, right. We got a lot of people All jumping right. on board. Woo. All right, we got Bonnie. Yes, Carl. Okay. Carl says, hello, Greg. Greg, can you see the comments? Maybe on the right. I can. Side. Yes. Hi, Carol. How are you? Yep. Good to see you. All right. Good. You can see them. We got Denise. We got Mark. Hey, Mark. We got Eric Edgerton. All is good. Thank you, Eric. We got Rhonda, Doug Campbell, Orange Tea in the Mug. We got Ashley. She says, hey, y'all, 34 degrees in Middle Tennessee in a Mick Ultra night. Whew. Uh, Jeffrey awesome. be having a glass of tea. <laughs> Travis is here. We got Roy. From Northern Ireland, guys. We got Northern Ireland right. in the house tonight. Wow, fantastic. All right. That's right. There's this lady called Jamie. I kind of know who she is. We've got Chris from yeah. Iowa. We got Tom McIntyre, Johnny V. There you go, man. Yeah, you got you got two heavy hitters on tonight, Johnny. We got Kevin Harrison on board, Mariela from Gainesville. Oh my gosh, Lene. What's up, girl? All right, guys, we've got a full house awesome. tonight, and I want to see these comments rolling because tonight's topic is something, well, let's put it this way. Whoever can discover the cure for phantom pain is going to own their own island, okay? <laughs> so, right. That's right. Wow. While we can't promise you a cure for phantom pain tonight, we can at least certainly give you the information on what it is, what it isn't, and what options you do have out there for treatment. Before we get started, I guess I should introduce myself because I know we got a couple of new people on board this evening, maybe even a couple of students from St. Augustine. Somebody told me saying that University of St. Augustine might be stopping in tonight. So if any of you guys are out there, don't be shy. Say hello. We got Brett on board. We got Chris. Oh, Christine. We got Brett and Alex. Oh, what's up, Alex? Alex, you and Brett wow. need to meet. Alex is a up is an up and coming prosthetist and he's doing amazing things. And the two of you need to make that connection at some point. So anyway. Oh, awesome. Awesome, Alex. Yeah. You're not far away. I'm over in Western Colorado. So look forward to it. There you go. All right, guys. So for those of you joining me for the first time this evening, welcome. My name is Kosi Bayoso. I'm a physical therapist, amputee specialist here in Tampa, Florida. And with me tonight, I pointed in the right direction for once. I have Greg. Greg, Greg is no stranger to my show. Not only, he's an above the knee amputee himself. He's an amazing prosthetist with years of experience. And because he's shy, I got to brag about him a little bit. He's a 22 time Paralympian and Olympian. And the list just kind of goes on and on and on. So Greg, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Uh, thank you, Cozy. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, hopefully we can talk and give some uh, some a little bit of ideas how to control phantom pain. So it's something that all of us uh, who are amputees experience, um, some of us more than others, and uh, hopefully we can be helpful. So thank you for inviting me on. Absolutely. And guys, I do want to send a special thank you to my sponsor for this evening, Vital Fit Skin Care. And it turns out that it's not my last show for the year, but it is my last show featuring one of my wonderful sponsors. So I do want to take the opportunity to thank all of my sponsors for this year, Blatchford College Park and Vital Fit. It has been a crazy year, but they have not wavered in their support. And I truly appreciate it. Um, Vital Fit, you all have, anybody who's heard me on the show has heard me talk about this. Uh, it's a skincare company that has an amazing product line that was designed specifically for people who use prosthetic devices. And guys, you know, on the show, I talk about exploring your options when it comes to prosthetic feet, prosthetic knees, sockets, suspension systems. I'm always telling you guys, don't settle for the first thing. Explore your options. I break that rule when it comes to skincare. <laughs> okay. After 18, I know Greg is, he's, he's an enthusiast as much as I am. 
after, you know, it's been 18 years now that I've been in this field. And after all those years of not having something specific, I can recommend to my patients for skincare, Vital Fit has solved all these problems. And, and they have a four product line. We're going to be doing a couple of giveaways tonight. They have a cleanser. They have a daytime moisturizer. They have a liquid to powder lotion and a nighttime moisturizer. And we've done a couple of shows featuring these products. These are amazing. They are wonderful for preventing sweat, odor, bacteria, friction in, within the socket. It keeps your other limb healthy. So those of you who know the statistics know that you're at a higher risk for losing that second limb. So taking the care of the skin on your other leg is extremely important, okay? This, is, this system is good for people with dry skin, with oily skin, problem skin, and it's very rare to find a product that can really serve a large variety of a population. So I can't say enough nice things about this product. And Greg's a user, so he can tell you a little bit more about how, how it's impacted him. Great. Well, thank you, Cozy. And I think, uh, uh, like Cozy said, if you've got any of these skin-related issues um, from prosthetic use, even uh, even if you have the best fit in the world, there's times where it can give you issues. And uh, in my personal life, I when I discovered Vital Fit, I would always have a little bit of chafing here and there from my activity level, and I, I just don't have that issue anymore. So again, like Cozy said, on the description of all the skin-related issues. Um, you can solve it with the Vital Fit system, and that's that is exactly what the system was designed for. Um, I've got a patient that I work with who was using it on his sound side, and he has had issues for 20 years with his sound fit and problem solved. So, mm -hmm. uh, another believer. So, uh, try out the Vital Fit system and get it get in here for the uh, the giveaway. So you may be able to. Uh, uh, get some free samples so absolutely so guys we actually have our first winner for this evening it's a it's a, the we had a posted a raffle on my cozy talks instagram page and our first winner tonight is stuart crouch so stuart i don't know if you're watching tonight if you are send me a message with your address and you'll be receiving the travel size kit guys i gotta brag on this travel size kit if you use the cozy 10 code jamie would you mind posting that if you use the COSI 10 coupon code, you get $10 off, which means you can get the travel size for just $10. That's a really good deal, guys. These are these products are priced very fairly, very good quality products. I know all of my, I have no samples here tonight because I basically give them all to my patients. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'd be holding up the bottles to show you. Um, you. But really amazing things. We've got, Car oh, Carol's here. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Carol. We've got Andrea from the Gator Amps from Gainesville representing. Stuart, you're on board. Congratulations for being our winner this evening. Guys, we're going to do another giveaway, so stick around. We've got Linda from Hurley, New York. Uh, Daryl got his new foot on. Daryl, I want to hear more about that new foot. Teresa's here. Sandra, man, we got a lot of people. Jim from St. Louis with Black Coffee. Carl. And actually, so Roy, she loves the Vital Fit. She's from Ireland. Uh, let's see, Leanne says right. that she is in Cozy, California, and she's a quad amputee and thankful to have Vital Fit as a part of her healthy routine. Agreed. Ashley Martin, another huge fan. We got a lot of fans here from Vital Fit, guys. It's not just hype. It's it's really working. It's good, it's good stuff. Great. That's um, right. That's and right. one of the other things I love about working with Vital Fit is they allow me to do shows like this and bring this information. So while we're not necessarily talking about skincare tonight, it's talking about Phantom Pain couldn't do it without the support of Vital Fit. They also do educational series hosted by <clears throat> us two screwballs here, and I can't point in the right direction. <laughs> so, uh, Vital Fit has been hosting educational series twice a month on Tuesday evenings. Um, so I know that Jamie, <clears throat> wink, wink, is going to be posting um, the, e the information for that as well. So if you guys want to get even more education on recovery from limb loss, Another 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 resource for you to check out. Awesome. All right. So the star of tonight's show, Phantom Pain. Okay. <sighs> this is this is I've got like pages of notes here because there's a lot to talk about, guys. There's a lot. There's, there's, and yeah. I do want to hear for those of you who feel comfortable sharing this information, I want to hear, like, do you experience phantom pain? Uh, where do you experience it? In your foot, in your leg, what part? What does it feel like? <clears throat> Describe the pain. And then also tell me if you have a trigger, if you know that there's a trigger that's going to get your phantom pain going, what is it? I want to see these answers in the comment section as we go. So 
basically the official definition of phantom limb pain is pain that's felt in the area where your arm or leg used to be. So even though the limb is gone, the nerve endings are still very much present at the site of the amputation. And they continue to send those pain signals. And the brain tries to kind of interpret what these, these signals are and things get scrambled up. And usually the brain tries to pull from an old memory. And unfortunately, a lot of times that old memory is pain, right? So let's talk about some of the, the common symptoms, all right? Phantom pain can begin as early as the first week after amputation, or it may not appear until weeks or months later out of the amputation, okay? The pain can be continuous or it can become in episodes, right? And the pain is usually felt in the distal part, meaning the part furthest away from the amputation. So for example, most people that I know of feel the phantom pain in their toes, in their foot, in their ankle. I don't think I've ever had an above the knee amputee, for example, describe phantom pain in their knee. How about you, Greg? Where do your patients- No, I haven't either. It? Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of reverb, but uh, everyone I've dealt with and, and encountered, it's always at the most distal uh, aspect of the amputation. So in the foot, the toes, um, that, that's primarily the, the, the problem area that we experience. Um, upper extremity amputees, fingers, sensation there. I've never heard anybody really talk about it uh, anywhere else but the hand or the toe. So mm -hmm. um, very, very common. Very common. And we've got some answers coming in here. So uh, let's see. Lots of fans here for Vital Fit. I love that. Mariella says, when the weather changes, the pain is more frequent. Ashley says, I get the most phantom sensations when the barometric pressure changes. Um, Brett says, just before I have to start urinating, it feels like my missing foot is being electrocuted. Um, Jim right. says, more phantom sensation now instead of pain. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, let's see, Charles says, no phantom pain, but I can feel my toes curl and the sole of my foot sometimes itches. Uh, Roy says, sometimes I itch my foot, but obviously it's not there, so I can't itch it, so annoying. Uh, Dick said, Dever says, I have no phantom pain. And guys, there are, I've had the occasional awesome. patient who comes in and says, nope, never had a phantom pain before. And I said, bless you, keep doing what you're doing, <laughs> whatever it is that you're doing. Um, Bonnie says it feels like my toes are squished in a really tight shoe at the end of the residual limb. So guys, you know, and, and I had this conversation with Greg before the show started in the 18 years I've been in practice, I've never had two patients tell me the same story about their, it's as individual as a person's fingerprint, how they feel it, where they feel it, what triggers it, how often, how far apart their episodes are when it starts completely, completely different. Okay. So one thing I do want to distinguish here, and because I've been seeing some comments on phantom sensation is I want to talk about the difference between phantom pain, phantom sensation, and residual limb pain. And if any of my students are listening, now's the time to listen to this part. Okay. Because a lot of times people will confuse the definitions and there's a different way of treating these three different things. So when a patient comes into your office and they're saying they have pain, you need to be able to distinguish what kind of pain it is. And for those of you who are the patient, my amputees out there listening, you need to be able to verbalize the pain. You need to be able to describe the pain so that your clinician can help identify where it's truly coming from. Okay. So phantom pain is exactly that. It's pain that is in the limb that is no longer there. And the pain can be described. We've had some great descriptions here. Tightness, like great, the foot yeah. being gripped in a vise. Electrocution, like it just shocks going into it. Burning sensation, crushing sensation, itching. I consider itching to be phantom pain just because it can drive a person bonkers. Great. So and it can interfere mm -hmm. um, with, with their daily function. Okay, so that's phantom <clears throat> pain. With phantom limb sensation, it's that you feel your toes or you feel where your toes used to be. You feel where your foot used to be, but it's not necessarily painful. It's just people describe it as, yeah, just that funny feeling that my toes are still there, but I know they're not. Okay. And then we have residual limb pain. Okay. And that is pain that is in the residual limb that is still actually there. Meaning 
you as a patient can say, my pain is right here. And you're pointing to a place on the limb that is still there. Okay. And it's really important to be able to distinguish between these things, because if it is residual limb pain, then that means we can track down what's going on and treat it. And if it's phantom pain, true phantom pain, then there are different treatment options for that. I'm going to be quiet for a little bit. And I'm going to let Greg talk a little bit because he knows a lot more about this. Well, I'm reading a lot of the comments, Cozy. Thank you. And it's amazing to see uh, all these definitions of uh, phantom pain or phantom limb pain. And here's one that really, uh, uh, when my blood sugar is too high, that's a new one that I haven't heard. So fantastic information to share with the group. We've got a big group on here. Yeah. Um, and I think what Cozy is saying is it could be, it's hard to figure out uh, what triggers it. And if you know there's an activity or when the barometric pressure changes and that triggers it, we can we can try to avoid some of that. So um, I think that's really interesting to read these comments. And I, I'm sitting here mesmerized on so many comments, yeah. um, but that one's really a, a big one, whether it changes. I've heard that a lot through patients. Yeah. I've had a lot of patients when they take their prosthesis off at night from an active day that, that all of a sudden it lights up for them. And yeah. you know, in, in that aspect, maybe it's a good time to put a shrinker on to give a little bit more um, more uh, contact to the skin to calm it back down. And we'll talk more about that, but uh, I really, I, I'm enjoying these comments. I'm just mesmerized reading them, but yeah. um, it is hard to pinpoint. And uh, I think what Cozy said, not everybody's different. And depending on how you became an amputee, um, if it was a traumatic uh, injury, if it was a crush injury, those seem to be uh, the, the patients that I run into that it, it happens more with. Mm -hmm. um, like Cozy mentioned, I'm an amputee of 40 years and I really haven't experienced phantom pain too much till about last week. And it was, it was phantom limb, but it was almost felt like for me, someone was stabbing me in the, in the, my toes. And it was the craziest sensation. And uh, I, for a guy who really never experienced it too much and worked with a lot of people who have and trying to explain it, I was like, wow. And I talked to Cozy before the show. I'm like, here it's happened to me just it, uniquely enough before we, we can address some of these issues. So um, I think for anybody who's not experiencing it, I see a couple of those comments, you know, like Cozy said, fantastic. Uh, that, that, you know, that's, uh, that's really great. And then a lot of these other, um, I'm just, uh, as I'm speaking, I'm reading here as well. Um, you know, long term activity above knee. Yeah, yeah, go Gilbert ahead, Cozy. Says, says, Gilbert says, I want to ask, is the pain a nerve type pain like burning or is it musculoskeletal like sharpness or aching? That's a very good question, Gilbert. Very good the question. The phantom pain itself can present in any number of ways. Like you've been hearing probably the descriptions, burning, stabbing, crushing, uh, electrocuting type pain, achy pain. Definitely. Like I think one person put up here like a Charlie horse in the back of their calf type pain. Great. What distinguishes it, Gilbert, is that it's occurring in the part of your leg that's no longer there. So that's the difference between the phantom pain and residual limb pain. So the residual limb, it means exactly that. The part of your leg that is still there, that would be considered residual limb pain. And again, guys, the more descriptions that you can give your clinicians, okay, and my, my PT students out there listening, the more you can interview your patient and really tease out of them the description of the pain, where they're feeling it, the episodes, and, and just start tracking them. And after a while, you may hopefully might see a pattern and maybe even identify a trigger that can help them decrease the amount, if not, you know, uh, help it out a little bit. Tom says, occurs when not hydrated enough. Uh, Tisha says, I have a sharp pain out of nowhere. Uh, I love these comments, guys. I'm trying to keep up as best as I can. Uh, Glenda says, I have it at night, shock sensation, especially after an active day. And like Greg said, I hear that a lot from my active patients that they wear their leg 12, 14 hours a day. And it's when they take their leg off that oh, the fireworks kind of begin. Okay. Um, Robin says, I commonly experience it episodically. And usually after a long week, when I feel fatigued, I'm an above the knee and I feel intense electrical shocks in the arch arc arch of my foot it usually starts at night and it is exhausting but for some reason subsides for no apparent reason uh she says i also feel it now suggestively because we're talking about it i'm sorry robin sorry there's a good point yeah 
Yeah, yeah, huge point that I've had a lot of patients when they start trying to describe their phantom pain, that it stimulates that brain rewire and they experience it. Um, one of the most interesting comments I'm reading right here is mm -hmm. from Travis. And uh, I'll read that one too cozy, but I talk to my brain out loud, using my mouth and ears to establish a connection between my brain and body. Phantom pain for me is the brain trying to find my amputated leg. This allowed my brain to rewire itself. I still have sensations, but not much pain. The phantom is cold. That is the most interesting comment. Thank you, Travis, because that kind of falls into some of the training that we're gonna to try to do and, and some of the therapy that we wanna talk about. So that one right there is a very good, um, you know, it comes to, and I'll go ahead, Cozy, I'm sorry. Very no, interesting no, comment. No, you're fine. And it, it actually ties into uh, the concept of neuroplasticity, which is something that we talked about briefly when I had uh, the surgeon, Dr. Dadesi, on board. And he was talking about targeted muscle reinnervation that basically the brain's ability to remap, to rewire itself. Um, and that's kind of one of the theories as to why phantom pain happens. Um, I call it the brain looking for love in all the wrong places, you know, that it, 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 it right. what used to be the part of the brain that controlled that leg that is no longer there, it might start trying to get cues from your hand, the part of your brain that has a hand that they've done in some of the studies that they've done on MRIs on a person who is actively experiencing their phantom pain, that the center of the brain that used to control the leg is, is firing like crazy. Um, so again, this is right. probably the reason why we don't have treatment options is because we still are trying to understand it. Um, so like you've heard me say this on the show, guys, like if you know what the cause of something is, then you can address it with appropriate treatment. And that's the killer with phantom pain is we're still trying to figure out what is the true cause. Is it something physiological in the brain? Is it something emotional in our psychology, which is tied into the physiological? Is it both? And then how do we address that? Um, so I'm a huge, sure. I'm a huge proponent of, of what that, what Travis mentioned is basically trying to rewire your brain. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about, we talked a little bit about some of the triggers, but let's go ahead and go over the list and guys, now's the time put in your triggers. Those of you who know what your triggers are for phantom pain and not everybody does put it in there. We've already seen stress, right? That's probably the number one that I hear from folks stress and fatigue, right? Um, we had someone yeah. there who blood sugars, which for me, that totally makes sense. When people, when diabetics, their sugar's not controlled, everything goes wacko, everything goes wacko. So it would make That's sense right. that it could trigger um, this episode. Uh, we heard urination and that's true guys, urination and defecation going to the bathroom. Um, I had one woman in my practice once that she said, you know, the first six months after her amputation, whenever she would use the bathroom, it would be this debilitating pain, which, you know, was embarrassing for her to talk about. And also you have to go to the bathroom. That's not a trigger you can avoid. Um, so that for her was a really tough, tough thing to try to conquer. Uh, sexual intercourse, uh, angina, chest pain, cigarette smoking. Y'all okay. know how much I love cigarette smoking. So if y'all are puffing away and having phantom pain, Stop smoking. That's, I'll leave it there. Uh, changes in barometric pressure. I know that when we start getting hurricane season and a hurricane's a common, I get a couple of patients talking about how their phantom limb starts kind of firing off. Uh, herpes zoster. So if, if, if there's an exposure there and cold, the exposure to cold. And I think I heard somebody here, which is interesting because sometimes I'll recommend to patients, okay, start off with a warm pack or a hot pack or cold pack. And for the most part, people are like, no, 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 no. I can't tolerate ice on my limb when I'm having phantom pain that it just, do you have any experience with that, Greg? Do you notice that with the cold? No, it, oh, absolutely. So I've had a lot of patients actually look into these new heated sockets who are out in the cold uh, weather training. Um, there's an, a guy out there to develop the heater, the little battery pack, just because cold seems to be one of the, uh, things that can trigger it. Um, so that that is pretty interesting. Somebody who's been smart enough in the prosthetic community to try to you know make that mousetrap. So that's kind of cool. If cold's a big one for you, then maybe you can look into your prosthetist with these new heated socket or heated elements you laminate right in. So that's kind of cool. Um, I see a lot of cold does this. And I agree with Cozy, if the patient's like, first thing I've always done with me and it's like, hey, get the ice pack. 
Um, some people cannot tolerate that. It will just electrify their, their phantom pain. So then, you know, the other, the other side of the coin is using a heat pack. And I think that that's a good, um, way of, you know, uh, addressing this, you know, elevation, and we'll get into all the different, uh, theories and thoughts of how to address this, but, um, absolutely cold can be one barometric pressure, you know, when the storm comes in, I've had a lot of patients, they know the storm's coming before they're looking yeah. out the window just because of it triggers that phantom pain. So another trigger, um, what's really interesting is seeing so many of, uh, of your comments out there. So thank you because, mm -hmm. you know, we're here and we learn every day as a process mm -hmm. and a PT. And this is really interesting to me to see all the, all the things that were happening. And I would like to see suggestions, what you're doing to share with the group to address it. Um, and we, we will cover some of that too, but please put that in there too, because it's really yep. interesting to read. Yep, and then we got, so Damon here put, I experience phantom pain almost daily, but it's not chronic. When I experience it, it's typically where my toes were, and it feels like they're being squeezed by pliers. Cold air on my chest is typically the trigger. It's weird. I sincerely believe when my core body temperature drops due to exposure to cold air, uh, that's when I get phantom pain. If the phantom pain lingers for several minutes or more, it's generally when I'm trying to sleep and stay warm in cool or cold room when I'm driving. We live in Florida and you got to have the AC. I know it's a catch 22, right? Uh, we've got Susan Walker. I like this one. She says, for six years, I've told my brain, what are you doing? There's no foot there. Stop. And it does. And I rarely get it. I just, I just say stop. Maybe awesome. use the mom voice. <laughs> use the mom voice. On your <laughs> phantom for the daddy <laughs> voice, stop. right? Uh, let's see. Stephen says, I wish I knew no warning. And again, some people, they come to me and they're going, I don't know what causes it. It just happens. And again, if I have a patient who tells me that I kind of just interview them every time they come into my clinic and just see if a, from a third party perspective, if I can pick out some sort of pattern or anything. Uh, we had another person here who said sugar, uh, their sugars are not under control. They get it. Connie says, taking off my leg, uh, Glenda barometer change. Uh, Eric, dehydration, and that's a big one, Eric. Thank you for bringing that up. Especially like for here in Florida in the summertime, dehydration can be a huge trigger um, for a lot of things. Um, Great. Not, not only in Florida. I think that even if you're, uh, like I live in Western Colorado, but you're in the mountains, you dehydrate as well. Any, any of my patients from here. So I think as a general rule, I think hydration is a big thing to really be um, aware of because if you dehydrate, typically you start going down your socket a little bit more, you get some more distal contact, which can fire off these neuromas or this phantom pain episode. So be really aware of hydration. I think it's one of the things we overlook, but it's it's super important because if you're getting dehydrated and you don't have that extra sock or to uh, take up some of that, you know, lack of volume, you can start bottoming out. And that's that can be right there what triggers it. And I've had patients say that. So yep. Yeah. And then Ashley, something to think about. Good good point. Yeah. Ashley says random question. Is there a difference in phantom pain and phantom sensation based on how you lost your limb? For example, I lost my leg to blood leg to blood clots and I get sensations, but I have seen some that lost limb due to trauma and seem to have the phantom pain. Yes, Ashley. Right. So while I haven't seen a common thread, one thing that some patients do report to me, especially my traumatic patients, is that it, it's mimicking the nature of their injury and probably one of the most, whew, and it makes me cringe when I even think about it. One of the more extreme patients I had, uh, she lost her limb in a motorcycle accident. And in the ride, in the ambulance to the ER, her skin was flapping and she could feel that the leg was still attached and it, ooh, it's just that sensation. That's her phantom pain. So she feels just that last moment of the skin still attached to the leg. And so obviously directly related to her trauma. So it's a very intense. And then other patients that they had traumatic injuries, it's a crushing pain, very similar to what they experienced. Um, so yes, I think in some, in, in cases you can really trace it back to the nature um, of the injury. Uh, let's see, but right. mm, Angela says, I want to co-seek below soak. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> yeah, I, I me too. <laughs> Greg, I still have to send you one. I, this is terrible. You've been on my show. I don't know how many times I. Uh -oh. <laughs> I got a couple left on my website, guys. You can find them there. Uh, let's see. Um, Leanne says, unfortunately for myself, all four limbs nonstop phantom pain and residual pain in both electrical burning clutch type phantom with and without prosthetics. Only relief is when I'm in the pool. 
and that's a fantastic okay. therapy just all around. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's move on. East stem, stay hydrated. Okay, let's move it, guys. I'm I'm loving all these. I'm gonna have to go back and reread all these comments after the show is over. Me too. I read these. I'm I'm um, And we have some above uh, some upper extremity amputees here tonight. So Randy says I lost my arm due to blood clots. Also, uh, let's see. All right. Yeah. Let's let's move on a little bit to some of the treatment options. Okay. So guys, there's two Great. basic. Okay camps, two basic approaches to treating phantom pain. There's the medication route, and then there's the conservative management, meaning without pain medication. So let's talk a little bit about the medication route. Um, medications are basically, the goal of these medications is to target the signals that the brain is receiving. More specifically, it's trying to cut off the signal that the, that the brain is receiving. So I'm gonna give just one example. There's a medication out there called ketamine, right? And without getting too much into the weeds about all the pharmacology, because it makes my eyeballs spin a little bit. Basically, ketamine is a type of anesthetic and it binds to a particular protein that the brain needs to receive a signal. So the ketamine binds to that protein. So the bro protein cannot attach to that part of the brain that's needed and it won't receive the pain signal. And that's how some of these medications work, okay? And we have everything across the board. We have everything from the basics, acetaminophen, Tylenol, right? Your uh, Aleves, your uh, ibuprofens, right? The over-the-counter medications, which usually it's what doctors recommend that you just start with just to see if any of those might work. Then we have our somewhat heavier hitters. We have our op opioids, the narcotic medications, things like codeine and morphine. We have things like antidepressants. So this is called off-label use, meaning these antidepressants are obviously usually they were made to tre treat depression, but studies have shown that they can also be effective for treating phantom limb pain, okay? You have anticonvulsants, and this is probably the one that I hear the most about. Gabapentin, also known as Neurontin, okay? Lyrica is another example, but again, off-label use. They were meant to treat seizures, but doctors have found them to be somewhat effective while treating phantom pain. Uh, muscle relaxers and beta blockers, okay? okay. So okay. here are some of my, I have a small soapbox when it comes to medications, okay? I am not against medications and I am not against the use of medications to treat phantom limb pain because I do recognize that some of this pain can be debilitating in the lives of some of my patients and the medications allows my patients sometimes to function, okay, in their daily progress. That being said, if you are going to be taking medications for phantom limb pain, guys, these are no joke. I, I advocate for doing it responsibly, okay? And the responsibility begins with the person, with, with the amputee themselves, taking and being an advocate for yourself, okay? So what that means is, number one, you need to do it under the direction of a pain management specialist, not just internal medicine. I love my internal medicine doctors, but if you're gonna be taking some of these heavy hitting medications, you need the doctor that does this every single day. That's the pain <laughs> specialist guy. You want the pain specialist doctor who's going to be reviewing extensively through all of your other medications to make sure that there's no interactions because like I said, these are some strong medications. You need the pain medication doctor who's gonna be explaining side effects and who's gonna start you off on the lowest dose that you can possibly tolerate, okay? And the reason why I'm hitting on these points, guys, is I've had patients come in and they've never been on any kind of narcotic or anti-convulsant or anything and they come in with a dosage that would knock an elephant flat on its butt and i asked them did the doctor even give you the option at starting at a lower dosage and they said no they never asked us so guys a lot of these medications they can become addictive they can become uh, habit forming and your body can develop a resistance to them or a tolerance excuse me a tolerance to them Okay, so if you start off on a super high dose, you're gonna feel good, but you're not gonna feel good for very long. Okay, and again, side effects, interactions with other medications. So that's my soapbox on medications that I am not against them, but if you are going to be taking them, you need to do it responsibly and constantly educating yourself with your doctor. Greg, your turn. 
<laughs> no, I agree with Cozy. I, I agree 100%. I think my view on medications, if if your phantom pain is controlling your life in, in, in all aspects and you're not being able to function because of that phantom pain or it's taking 70% of your life away, then yes, that's when you look at the medications. But I agree 100% with Cozy. It's pretty easy to get uh, a tolerance built up to them. And if you start on these high doses, because I, I met a patient, uh, she was on like 3,600 milligrams of gamma pentin, And that's like the maximum dose to start with. And there's nowhere to go from there when you start building tolerances. So I'm, I'm 100% in belief of, you know, uh, medications work. Uh, they have their place and you may, I mean, when this gets completely out of control, then that, that, that may be, uh, you know, the next step, if the medications start failing, invasive or like invasive surgery, which I know that I could probably speak for everybody. The last thing we want to do is have additional surgeries. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm not opposed to any medications. I do know that um, some of the medications can be a little bit altering and, and uh, sedative feeling. I've had patients on gamma pentin that it works great for and they're fine. Their patients say they can't function on it. So uh, those patients, we recommend taking that medication when you go to bed. Uh, and that's another way of, uh, you know, tackling this rhino is maybe you take your medications uh, when you go, you know, to, uh, to sleep at night because it's not going to interpret your outcome during the day. But again, you're not sedated, may it help with sleep because a lot of amputees today that I deal with, everybody, and I think in the comments section, they talk about a lot of this happens in the evenings when you do take off your prostheses from being in that for, you know, 12, 14 hours a day, like, like uh, Cozy stated. So, um, it, it, you know, um, I think having a, a, a pain management specialist and a conservative one is not a bad deal. Um, so I think that's something to think about. I think there's other techniques that we could talk about and we will talk about. But I think in the extreme uh, points, um, like Cozy said, I, I think I get opposed to doctors that's just sling medications. I did see a, a comment in here. Yeah, um, I saw that from- uh, It was Steve that said, yeah, medical personnel don't understand APTs now. Um, you know, it is what it is. Search out that right doctor. It's just like your process. You have to find somebody that you trust that was willing to listen and set goals with you uh, for the outcome. So, um, so there's my soapbox, and I no, think that's really important. And and we're seeing great comments here about this. So Susan says, "I get my narcotic from my amputee doc, who is the head of amputee specialist at the Parkwood Rehab Institute." Good. And if awesome. I miss my medication, it feels like my residual limb is broken. So Susan, to me, this is an appropriate use of the medication. You're being followed by the right personnel and it's allowing you to function in your life. And this is something that I've always kind of been a big proponent of when it comes to pain management in general, even with my earlier years of working in burn trauma, orthopedic trauma, where you have this horrific pain uh, traumas. And I would tell my patients, you know, if your pain level is eight or nine out of 10, that's a pretty intense pain level. You want to take enough pain medication to bring it down to a four, to that level of pain that, yeah, you're still feeling it, but it's tolerable. You can get through your day and you can get through what you have to do. And again, this was just suggestions I would give my patients because I would tell them if, if you take enough pain medication to bring your pain level down to a zero, you're basically snowing yourself and you're making yourself not being able to function because you're in so much of a fog. Um, and we had another comment here, a person who said, yeah, I was on the gabapentin and I felt like I was in a fog all day. Um, so it's, it's a very delicate balance. And guys, I've been through my own cancer surgeries. I've been through many surgeries, chemotherapy. So I, I from a personal standpoint, I, I get it. I get it when you're in that kind of pain and having to judge what to take, when to take, how much to take it. Um, and again, it's worth finding that doctor. And my, my cousin, he's a pain management doctor over here in St. Petersburg. So he and I are always having these conversations. Um, and he's, he's always saying he needs to know as much as he can about his patients and educate them as much as he can um, to make sure that they're, they're using these medications responsibly. Um, but Great. so now that we've kind of whacked that dead horse with medications we're going to bring in the other side right. okay and much okay like you know i mm -hmm. no uh one, one more thing and i i, I saw yeah. a comment in here that yeah. I, I can't with, walk without the hydromorph and and i think that's fine if you're again i'll reiterate if your life is impacted and you're living in pain that's over a 
eight daily, then that's when the medication is necessary and take it as prescribed. Yeah. Uh, Cozy had a, a friend of mine on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he said something to me, I'll never forget, a, a veteran that was blown up in an in a explosion. He said, that I'm always going to be in some uh, form of pain. And, I, I, and what Cozy just said, uh, just sparked that my thought to that. We, we never may and you know wish that we may never diminish pain always being an amputee um, depending on the scenario of injury if it was crush explosion uh whatever that may be so i think what Cozy said is something you really need to take home you may not ever control the pain 100 percent. there may be always a little bit of pain we live in and that's you know that's the harsh reality of this but um take it responsibility, take it as prescribed. I think that's the biggest thing. I'm the worst when it comes to medication. I don't take it as prescribed. I'll be like, oh, I need that now. Okay, I'm good. And I stop. And that's, uh, and a lot of doctors that I've worked with, um, they look at your medical history and everything is prescribed because of the history. Um, and even for me and, and the extreme injuries I've had, I'm just, I'm the worst patient when it comes to that. Cause I'll just be, okay, I feel good next. And that's not the way to think, take this. So um, on what Cozy said, I think uh, we may always experience a little bit of pain in our life. Um, that's just what it is. So um, I had to throw that in. Okay, so we yeah. probably should move off the pain uh, medication stuff and move on to some other therapies that we, yeah. we, we, we recommend here. Yes, and and Susan, uh, you know, chronic pain is life altering. And, and you're right, Susan. When, when a person has pain, that's, right. that's all they focus on. Um, and it, 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 that's right. It, it controls you. Yeah. Um, so guys, we're going to talk about the other, the flip side to it. So the same way you, you know, yin and yang, right? Yin and yang, you got to have that balance. So, you know, when someone who is uh, experiencing depression, right, they might be receiving medications to help physiologically with what's going on with their depression. But if they don't receive counseling, right, to change some of their life habits to kind of remap, help remap their brain, their outcomes are not going to be that successful. Okay. You might go and have a knee replacement, a bright, beautiful new knee put into your body. But if you don't receive the rehab afterwards, you're not going to have a good outcome. So for me, I see phantom limb That's pain right. as a very similar. You have to approach it in different ways. So for those of you who are taking medications for it, I would encourage you listen to these next conservative management techniques. Uh, a lot of these techniques, you probably have already heard about them, but I find that people are very quick to dismiss these techniques because they just either seem too simple or they tried it once and it didn't work or they read that it, it, it's a technique that's been around for a long time so it's no longer useful you know i've heard a lot of different excuses but i would encourage you take a take a look at some of these techniques and greg's going to be demonstrating one of them tonight that you can actually start from your own home and practicing so we've already heard from some people here okay and guys now's your chance those of you who have your unique hack for how you treat your limb pain without medication, put it in the comment section right now. Okay. Um, but some of the, I'm just going to kind of go through a list and then we're going to focus on a couple of things. Acupuncture. I honestly can tell you, I don't know much about acupuncture, but I do have patients who go and have it done and they feel like they have relief. Uh, massage of the residual limb, especially if you have sensitivity. And that's something I'm going to touch upon a little bit later. The use of a shrinker. Okay. And again, Huge. Greg briefly mentioned this, especially for those of you that when you take your limb off at night, that's when you feel the fireworks of the phantom limb pain, putting a tight shrinker or not too tight, but a compressive shrinker on can kind of help quiet that noise and provide that stimulation that your limb needs. Mirror box therapy, which Greg is going to demonstrate for us. Okay. Sure. Biofeedback. A lot of physical therapists out there nowadays have biofeedback machines. Um, where you can look visually imaging, you, you can see a hand and you can see the hand closing, assuming that you're an upper extremity amputee, and you can see the hand opening and closing. So it's kind of like a mirror box type thing, but on the computer, which is pretty amazing. Uh, TENS units, and that's something else we're going to cover tonight. TENS units are becoming extremely popular. We're going to talk a little bit about why that could possibly work. Virtual reality, virtual reality imagery. I know in the VA here, they have some amazing VR, and I'm really hoping that technology becomes a little bit more available to mainstream. Hydrotherapy, and we had someone here mention um, that they feel comfort when they're in the pool. Warm compresses, uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, and again, that's kind of one of those kind of 
starting out there. Um, proprioceptive exercises, and y'all know how much I love my proprioception, right? So the ability, proprioception is your body's ability to know where it is in space. So with my patients and then the protocols I put them through in treatment, I do a lot of proprioceptive exercises where I'm feeding the brain a lot of information so that it can start to accept that prosthesis as its own. Did I cover pretty much everything there as far as like the big, big ones? Did I get everything right? I think so. I think you, you yeah, I think you missed uh, a couple that I'll say is PT. Yeah. That's huge. Physical therapy, um, being physical, um, not only seeing your physical therapist, uh, sorry, her, um, but going and being active and doing something daily. That's that's a, a big one that uh, I see uh, that maybe you overlooked. Um, uh, surgery can be an aspect at the very end and uh uh, I think one of the interesting one is uh, neural neural feedback training too is a new one that's helping with pain management. It's very uh, similar to uh, uh, biofeedback training, but the virtual reality, hopefully like Cozy said, that becomes mainstream because that's helping a lot of veterans and that's kind of birthed in the VA system and the DOD system now, but very, very exciting to see that. Um, imagery, um, finding something that takes your mind away from that, that pain at that moment. And I think uh, I thought I saw a comment in here. I'd have to scroll back. Um, become an artist, uh, music, anything to take your mind off that scenario. And uh, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I experienced some fan of pain last week and I was like, it was uh, pretty, pretty incredible, pretty, pretty uh, uplifting to me to say, wow, this is really what it is. And I forced myself for a walk and it went away. So again, that's physical therapy of going out and just doing something to take my mind off, focusing on that aspect of pain. So that's a big one too. Um, and I'm, I'm reading here more stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, I, and here's another one that just came up that, you know, I live in Colorado and, and people, uh, somebody put cannabis. I think the CBD uh, has been very popular and very helpful for some patients. And I've heard that out there as well. Um, I don't know, I, saw, I thought I saw some, Cannabis, but you know, that's not legal everywhere. So, um, but I think CBD is a, a way to venture into something that's um, maybe not habit forming, like, you know, some opiates or stronger medications. So something to think about. Um, uh, so go, go ahead, Cozy. I'm just, I, I'm yeah. mesmerized with the comments. Yeah. No. Everybody, awesome stuff tonight. It's just, just fantastic. I want to touch upon what Alex brought up. He brought up uh, TMR, which is total muscle re um, targeted muscle reinnervation. Um, and we actually did, I did a full featured show on TMR two months back. So if you guys want to learn about TMR in detail, check back in my Facebook videos in a couple months back and you'll see it. But basically targeted muscle reinnervation is taking the nerve that was cut right at the level of the amputation and plugging it back into an existing muscle. So, you know, unfortunately, surgical techniques really haven't changed much since the Civil War era. We just have better right. anesthesia nowadays, but it's still kind of the same surgical technique where they pull a nerve, they cut it, and then it retracts back into the muscle. So if it's a sensory nerve, right, a, a, a nerve that gives you the sensation and scar tissue forms around that, then you're talking about a hot spot called a neuroma. OK, and guys, right. this ties back into what I said earlier about being able to distinguish between true phantom limb pain and residual limb pain. OK, a lot of times what people think is phantom pain, it's actually a neuroma um, that's causing a hot spot. And again, you got to you got to figure out one or the other. Now, is it to say that an aroma can cause phantom pain? Sure, that could certainly be a cause of it. Sure. So basically, with the targeted muscle reinnervation. They take that nerve that's just floating around in the, in the middle of your soft tissue, plugging it back into the muscle. So basically, it's giving the nerve something to do. It's giving it its job back, right? I don't, you know, that, that saying, right. idle hands make devils work. So if you've got a nerve yeah, that's right. not connected to a muscle, it's going to get into trouble. Um, so yeah, I'm, Alex, I'm very excited to see what the research shows on this because I think it is instrumental in helping prevent phantom pain. And again, that's just my observation. Um, so yeah, guys, if you wanna learn more about targeted muscle renovation, go a couple months back and watch that show. Um, moving along, there was something else here. Steve says, my new pain management doctor found nerve groups that was created the pain and we did a nerve block and it was great. 
And I've seen that guy. Some people get um, a spinal cord, like a little uh, block, little machine put in the back of their spinal cord and it delivers the pain medications there. Uh, some people have a little more drastic where they might, it's called a rhizotomy, where they'll, they'll uh, cut the nerve, sensation nerve in the spinal cord to prevent that connection from happening again. A bit more drastic measures. Um, some people, some of, one of my patients, one of the docs here, they do uh, injections for neuromas. And this particular doctor is very successful with that. Um, so again, guys, it goes back to what is causing the pain, you know? Where is it coming from? Because then you can treat it accurately. Uh, Great. What are our thoughts on graded motor imagery? Thomas, I don't know much about it, but I like what I hear about it. And it ties into very similar to uh, virtual reality, very similar to how mirror box therapy works, very similar to how biofeedback works, okay? So guys, remember what I said, medications, right? they try to interrupt the signals to your brain, right? So with these conservative techniques, we're basically trying to rewire your brain. We're trying to remap your brain. And the human brain is amazing in that regard. It's amazing what the brain is capable of relearning or you know, learning new tricks and how to retrain your brain. And we've, we've already heard that. We will, Greg said it tonight, um, about how he distracted himself by going on a walk with physical activity and his pain subsiding and other people here who have had similar, similar messages. Okay. Um, ooh, this is a good one. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. I'm reading too. I'm just mesmerized. So yeah, so good information. Says, either massaging area on one leg that is still there as weird as this sounds, massaging the air where your near foot toes are missing while watching that being done. Yes, Heidi. Yes, that is completely so like a great example of, of how this can work. So let me touch a little bit on, it kind of ties in, um, residual limb sensitivity. And I'm going to see if I, if I can post a live video of this tomorrow when I'm in the clinic with one of my patients to demonstrate better. But basically, you know, a lot of times when folks are fresh out of their amputation or even a little further out, their residual limb is very sensitive to touch, meaning that they can't tolerate, like they can tolerate their own hand on their residual limb, but they can't stand to have like bed sheets on top of their leg. Or if their clinician with cold fingers touches their residual limb, they go jumping through the roof. It's just a very irritating feeling, okay? So desensitization of the residual limb is something that can be worked on and can be improved upon to help with this. Um, and usually what I do with my patients is I start off with something very soft, like a cotton puff or a very soft towel, and I'll start gently massaging their residual limb, starting at the end of the residual limb and working my way up. And then as they can tolerate more touch, then it'll, I'll either use a towel with more texture or I'll use something a little bit heavier, maybe like a hot pack, something that, that'll kind of put a little compression on there. Um, or a massage, you know, with the Vital Fit products, it's great because I have massage, <laughs> I use it as a massage lotion <laughs> with the daily right, moisturizer. Right. I do, I love it. I use the daily moisturizer <laughs> and I'm working on massaging the limb. So that is something like if you can identify, wait, I have residual limb sensitivity, okay? This is something that can be improved upon. It takes time and you have to be consistent with it a few minutes every day doing this desensitization, but it works, okay? That's right. Um, Less invasive. No, no. Let's see. Uh, sorry guys, I'm trying to get through some of these comments. Make sure yeah, not... there's so many great, great yeah. uh, comments here. So um, it's just mesmerizing. Yeah. So Pat says massaging the residual limb when phantom pain occurs seems to help. And again, guys, what Heidi said too, you know, if massaging your actual limb help you, try massaging the air where you feel the phantom pain. Or what I also tell my patients, especially when you're having that itchy sensation, if you're having the itchy sensation, say on your phantom left foot, scratch the bottom of your right foot. And I've, I've had people do, and, and that's the thing, like with these conservative treatment guys, you're, you're not using narcotics or heavy medications. So you can try and experiment and see what works for you. 
Um, and when Greg starts to explain the mirror box, and actually maybe we'll start doing that now, Greg. Um, I'm going to switch the Great. screen so you guys can see him better. Okay. Um, thank you, Cozy. Uh, I think, uh, you know, thank you for all the great comments, everybody. Like I said earlier, uh, we always learn daily from patient interaction, and that's the most fantastic part of Cozy Show is patient interaction is helpful for everybody. So um, uh, should, we can both reach out to you and, and share some of this literature that we, um, but I think you can go on and Google uh, pain, you know, um, pain management for phantom limb pain, and you'll get so many different, uh, you know, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, there's so much information out there that will touch on a lot of things we're talking about tonight. So if we, if you heard something and we missed it, um, go ahead and Google, check it out and, you know, anything we can do. But again, I, I agree with Cozy is if we can take the non-surgical way of doing this, I mean, some of the TMR, re, you know, re, routing nerves and stuff that all works and i know patients that have done this and it works fantastic but it's again you're going into pretty invasive surgery so if we can do you know uh, biofeedback repositioning is one thing is we we overlook is just repositioning the you know the residual limb um, by propping it up under a pillow um, if this occurs at night, that could be just the game changer right there. So that's a good one. I'm really keen on acu, uh, acupuncture, acupressure. So that those are two good ones. But um, the mirror box therapy is really interesting to me because you're retraining your brain by visual stimulation. I think you really got to think this through. And I see some great comments of people um, in you know visual, you know visualizing and almost meditating um, in the same concept of how these mirror box works. So I want you to really think it through, uh, almost go to a meditative state. And I think that's another one we've probably uh, missed is as simple as meditating and clearing your brain of all that stress or what's, what you think or uh, these things that trigger probably phantom pain. So th that's another one you could try. So I think that's great. So I'm going to try to move my computer here without turning it off because I did that to Cozy a little while ago and show you how simple mirror box therapy can be. Um, you can buy, if you're a, a lower extremity amputee, you can buy a, a, like a wall mirror for the back of your door. They're about seven or eight dollars at Walmart or um, at your at your drug stores. They work very well for lower extremity. You can put it between your legs and uh, get the reflection of your uh, sound side. You know, the, hence we're talking about you know unilateral amputees here. Um, and you know, when you wiggle your toes. That reflection is retraining your brain to try to take away these sensations of phantom pain or pushing the gas pedal, moving your ankle, even bending the knee as much as uh, that works. But on upper extremities, and it's a lot easier to demonstrate for an upper extremity, um, I've got this mirror box here and I'll show you. I just made a box. I've got a regular box. This is more of an upper extremity kind of scenario. I'm sorry. Okay, hang on. Let me turn it more. I, you got you to gotta coach me, Cozy. So way, let's see. Oh, I got to turn it the right go. direction. That's yep. right. There so um, when we're going in the right direction here. So again, this this box, you can buy these little mirrors at Walmart or Joann's or Michael's. Uh, I taped it to a box. I went ahead and cut a hole in the box. Um, this was a proven technique through the VA systems uh, that works uh, because if you can take and put your, let's just say I'm, I'm a, a right, you know, blow amp, you know, blow uh, um, elbow amputee or above, I can put my, you know, amputated side in the box and then take my sound side and put it in front of the box. So, and as I move the sensation and, you know, focusing on the movement of my upper extremity, my, you know, unamputated side or your, sound side, however you want to look at it, you know, give it a thumbs up for PT or whatever, however you want to think this through, that reflection will give you the sensation of that rewiring your brain that we're working on. So this this is a simple technique that you could do daily. And I've, I've read a lot of stories and a lot of um, background therapy on this is uh, do it every day, do it when you encounter phantom pain, um, but focusing and clearing your mind and visually seeing my thumb. I want to give myself a thumbs up. I want to see and feel that I'm giving, moving that thumb or that index finger. So it's as simple as this. And you can just see, this is just a simple make it home technique that you can engage with mirror therapy. So um, yep. it works, it works. And uh, 
again with a lower extremity amputee. Uh, let me see if I can grab you my. Do you have that mirror there? Okay, there we yeah. go. Yeah. So if we take this mirror, I'm yep. kind of tied to my computer. I apologize. So these are just basically uh, just so, you know, behind the mirror uh, or behind the door mirror. And I would put this between my patient's legs. Let me hold it up a little bit. But let's just say this is my patient over here. Hang on a sec. Let me grab him. <laughs> I've got a. <laughs> Uh, so it would be the same scenario as taking your residual limb, putting this between your legs and holding up that prosthetic fit. And I'm not doing a very good job here, you guys. I, I apologize. But again, the reflection of the prosthetic fit or the sound fit to the mirror. So low, this would be kind of a lower extremity demonstration. Um, kind of hard to do on this little monitor, but same thing, putting this between your legs and moving the foot and the ankle and even the knee. So um, so that's not the best therapy because this mirror is so big. But again, for lower extremity, I think it's very important to try. Yeah. So, uh, so Cozy, what's your thought? Thank you. Actually, Greg, can you move your camera back so we can see your handsome mug there? Yep. All right. There we go. So, you no, know, and, and guys, this is something that I, I need to actually build myself a box. I just have the simple behind the door mirror um, and, and guys, again, let me walk you through a little bit also what, what I like to do with, with, with patients with this. It's almost like a massage type environment. You know, those of you who have had the chance to go get a massage, a nice spa, and they dim the lights and they have uh, nice calming music. So it, it's about calming your system down. It's really about calming your system down. So usually I'll put my patients in a darker, one of my, the darker rooms in my, um, in my clinic where there's not, you can't hear the music blaring in the clinic from my younger clinicians that are there um, and put the mirror in between their legs. And I just have them just look at their leg. Just start there. Just look at the leg. It's a very strange sensation if you've never tried that before to see two whole legs there and just yeah. let them kind of soak that in first. And I keep my mouth shut, which is tough for me, but I keep my mouth shut and just let them absorb that for a few minutes. And then just starting simply, and I'll tell them, wiggle your toes. Just wiggle the toes. And just start by doing that and just see what that feels like. And again, keeping everything nice and quiet. Practice the breathing. If I notice that somebody has holding their breath, I'll cue them on taking those big deep breaths in and out. Not terribly complicated, okay? But when you pay attention to these little details, that's where you start to see some of this progress. After the wiggling the toes, then move your way up gentle ankle pumps where you move your foot up and down and you're watching in the mirror as you're doing this. Okay. And then just again, reflecting on how is this changing? Just focus on looking at that foot. Okay. And then moving the knee, like Greg said, doing just very simple movement. Now, if the person has a very specific phantom pain that they're just like, it hurts here. Okay. Then we can kind of, after we've started that initial introduction to it, then say, okay, Let's massage your sound leg where you're having that phantom pain. So if you're feeling the phantom pain on the outside part of your ankle, then providing a little gentle massage on the sound side on the outside part of the ankle. This is also where sometimes you might introduce the TENS unit in the combination. But again, I usually tear things. I usually start very, very simple and then just kind of feel where the patient is, if they're having any relief. If they're having relief just by looking in the mirror, wonderful. Ooh. And we, we just keep it there. One knock that I hear from people that get discouraged is they say, well, I tried the mirror box therapy and the minute I took away the mirror, the pain came back. And my response to that is, well, that means it worked though. <laughs> And if you right. just have something that you can start with, even if it just gives you a few minutes of relief, every day staying consistent with it on a daily basis that's where i see people who say yeah this is effective plus doing your proprioceptive exercises plus doing desensitization of your residual limb okay guys so it's not just one thing it's kind of trying to target it from different viewpoints so that over the course of time you'll hopefully notice some improvement and it does take consistency so i think this is where we lose a lot of people that could benefit from this because they don't understand how it works and how it needs to be consistent over the course of time. Okay. Uh, there was a great That's question a here that I wanted to address. 
here we go. So Ashley, I am three years post amputation, even though I can wear my leg and all that. And I'm very, and Ashley is a very active young lady. She says, I still get the shocking sensation when I rub moisturizer on my limb each day. What could cause that? I really don't like touching my limb because of the shock. So Ashley, two things that kind of stand out in my mind. Number one, maybe you have a neuroma. Okay, so think of a neuroma like your funny bone. If you touch that neuroma, you get that shocking sensation. So it could be that you have a neuroma that gets set off, or it could be that you still have residual limb sensitivity. And yeah, even three years post, yeah, you can still be feeling that. So Ashley, sure. um, yeah. I know you have a good physical <clears throat> therapist, Ashley, who can maybe distinguish between the two to see if you have a neuroma or if you just have residual limb sensitivity, in which case using a desensitization technique can be effective for you. Greg, do you have any other comments on that one? No, I agree. I, I, I concur with what you're saying. Um, being able to recognize if it is an aroma, because we really didn't cover that too much. Uh, a lot of patients that I deal with uh, have had neuromas, and I think I even have one myself, and it, you'll feel it if you probe into your residual limb and there's like almost a, like a little grape or a pea up to the size of a walnut. I've seen them where they can be very debilitating, but, um, and very, very sensitive to touch. So yeah. good points there. Um, when you get to that extreme, uh, obviously um, that that's when you go talk to your, your pain management doctor and um, maybe get a, a, a nerve block on that or something if it's that bad. Um, well, I, I'm reading a couple different other comments. Uh, aqua therapy seems to be really working for a lot of people. So swimming, I think that's fantastic comments. So thank you, everyone. And then uh, Catherine here, I tell my parent, my patients to complete for five minutes, three times a day, because I think intensity matters for success. And I think she's a, talking about the mirror box therapy. And I think that's exactly what Cozy's saying too, is you really have to rewire your brain and do this consistently. Um, one time's not gonna change anything. It's just like if we're lifting weights and doing our PT, uh, one time to the gym may help, but you want to do it repetitively to rewire and retrain your brain. So um, good comment. Thank you, Catherine. So, And here's a here's the question. I was like, oh, this is a good one. Ben says, what if like me, you're a double below knee? <sighs> so I've got an answer. What about you, Greg? <laughs> well, I want to hear yours first, but I do yeah, have one too. You so. first. Yeah, you first. So <laughs> a couple of different, a couple of different approaches, Ben. Um, usually, usually with double amputees, there will be one side that is more intense than the other, right? And it could be that you have phantom limb pain on one limb, but not the other. So try to figure out, okay, let's say my right leg is my better leg, meaning I have less pain uh, in the right leg, then I would put that leg up against the mirror and that's gonna be your sound intact leg and do the exact same treatment. Or if you can tolerate, if you're not experiencing pain with your prosthesis on, put your prosthesis on, right? And put that up against the mirror. And then we're gonna talk also about TENS units. So that might be applicable to you as well, Ben. All right, your turn, Greg. No, I agree with Cozy. Again, I always concur with what Cozy says. If you are a bilateral in your experience of this, now it could go either way. If you've got a cosmetic cover, I've had a bilaterals do mirror box therapy with their stronger or more dominant leg or less painful, or um, and it's the same kind of retraining that you're seeing that cosmetic prosthesis. Now, I had another patient I you know, uh, referred that kind of therapy to, and he was like, listen, I don't have cosmetics, I'm looking at a pipe. And I was like, okay, well, okay, maybe a TENS unit, but just what Cozy said. So it's something you gotta re just try. And I think that that's the, uh, the whole basis here is giving you a, a different options to try to overcome this phantom way, you know, the phantom pain that, you know, can, you know, ruin your day for sure. But um, try with the prosthesis on and try to think in your mind, I'm going to move that foot. Some of these prosthetic ankles out there um, move. So you can actually apply pressure in your socket and you'll see movement at the ankle and things like that. Again, we're trying to retrain our brain to forget about this uh, pain sensation. So I think it's worth, worth a try um, and or you may have to go with some type of stimulator device like a TENS unit that we really haven't covered too much, which really does work for a lot of people. 
We're going to, yeah, we're going to get to that one. And Bonnie, I I do want to address this because I do have uh, more than one individual here who has uh, complex regional pain syndrome. Um, So she asked what happens, what helps when your sound leg is now fully affected by the CRPS? No way to massage or do anything to that leg. Any suggestions on how to deal with phantom pain without meds? Got off the meds, don't like the way they made me feel. So Bonnie, um, in a case that's a little more, yours is a little more extreme because the CRPS is very intense. And guys, complex regional pain syndrome, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, we did a talk on that about a month ago. So if you want to learn more information about that, refer back to those videos. Um, but Bonnie, in the meantime, it could be that, again, you got to troubleshoot. Um, mirror box therapy, I still think it would be worth trying, um, even with your CRPS leg because I agree the massage might be just a bit too intense for you um, for CRPS. Um, It could also be that you try the mirror box therapy using your residual limb as the strong leg and just seeing how that works. Um, So again, playing around with it just a little bit. I don't know about a TENS unit for you, Bonnie. I I don't know if I would recommend a TENS unit for CRPS leg. leg That could be a little dangerous there. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that, but I would say try try the mirror box. Just put that mirror in between your knees and just see what works. Um, give it a try. Uh, let's see. Gosh, we got so many good comments in here, guys. If I'm not reading your comments, I promise you I'm going to be reading these with a fine tooth comb after the show is over. Uh, Catherine says, I tell my patients to complete for five minutes a day three times a day because I think intensity matters for success. And and she's absolutely right, guys. It's not necessarily doing it for a long period of time. People think, oh, I gotta do it for an hour. No, 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 just a few minutes. The same thing with the residual, with the um, desensitization protocols. It's not sitting there for an hour massaging your limb. It's just a few minutes, but you have to do it consistently. And I agree with Catherine. If you can do it three times a day, yeah. Do it three times a day, especially if you find relief during those few minutes. Uh, Let's see. Leanne asked, can a neuroma be diagnosed by touch or sonogram? So for me, Leanne, because I don't, I'm not a physician, so I cannot use ultrasound for diagnostic purposes like that, or at least I don't have one in my office. Some of my other colleagues do. Um, But basically it's it's just my thumb and going, does that hurt? And usually if they have a like Greg said, you, you can sometimes even feel that neuroma. It feels like a little black bean underneath the skin. And then when you push on it, your patient goes through the roof and hates you for the next three days. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty localized sensation right there. Uh, TENS unit. Okay, let's talk a little, little bit. I love it. Jamie, actually, would you be able to put the link up um, so let's talk a little bit about the TENS, okay? It's an electrical stimulation unit, and you guys hear a lot about this in you know, pop culture society, people using TENS units for getting strong, getting ripped abs, for things like, you know. So 20 years ago, not 20, 18 years ago, when I started out in this profession, you could only use a TENS unit if you were being prescribed one by a physical therapist. Now you can literally go on Amazon, and that's kind of not something I necessarily agree with because there's a lot of contraindications for using a TENS unit, meaning there's a lot of things that could be going on with you that could make using a TENS unit dangerous. So before you use a TENS unit, clear it with your physical therapist. And notice I said physical therapist, not doctor, because the physical therapist Mm -hmm. is the one who knows all the ins and outs about a TENS unit more than a doctor does. That's That's kind of our thing, right? right? All right, disclaimer out. All right, so when it comes to the TENS unit, It operates on something called the gate control theory of pain, okay? So here's how it works. Guy walks into a doctor's office. He says, doctor, doctor, my thumb is really hurting. All I can think about is my sore thumb. It hurts so bad, so bad. Doctor gets out a hammer, whacks him upside the head. He said, well, doesn't hurt anymore, does it? Right? So basically the theory of the gate control theory of pain is When your brain is thinking about one particular annoying stimulus or pain, you need to give it another stimulus to think about, to block that out. And that's what the TENS unit does. When it's at that setting, meaning it's not at a setting for muscle stimulation, it's at a lower setting, it's going to give you a pins and needles sensation. So it's causing your brain to focus on that sensation and hopefully 
distract you from the phantom pain or distract your brain right. from the phantom pain. Okay. So again, if you are cleared by your physical therapist to use the tens unit, this is something that I like to kind of experiment a little bit with my patients to see what works. For some of my patients, they want it directly on their residual limb, and that's where they notice relief. For other patients, I put it on their sound leg where they're feeling phantom limb pain. Okay. So again, it's one of those things where everybody's a little bit different and you just got to kind of work with the placement. Okay. But again, not something that you want to just grab off of Amazon guys. This is something you need to do with the supervision of a physical therapist. Yeah. Agreed. All right, we've got our next giveaway. So Jamie posted, she posted a link for Vital Fit SR. And guys, we're gonna be giving away a four part kit, right? So you're gonna be getting the cleanser, the daytime moisturizer, the liquid to powder lotion, and the nighttime moisturizer, guys. You're gonna get the full kit, all right? Go to this link and tell me what is the name of the first blog the, the title of the first blog that appears on that page. Thank you, Jamie, for posting that again. So guys, first person to type that in the comment section is going to uh, win a four part series. And there's actually a question, I think it was from Julie from way in the beginning that I did want to address. She was asking about the liquid to powder lotion. And Julie, of the okay. four products, that one's probably my favorite. <laughs> Um, we have other liquid to powder lotions on the market. And basically, guys, for those of you who are not familiar, it's basically uh, a lotion that when you put it on and it dries within a, within a minute and it turns into like a little powder. So there's a lot of those out there on the market, but a lot of them get really gummy and they get just gross <laughs> after a person's been wearing a prosthesis. This is one of those few, this is the only liquid to powder lotion that I've seen that when a person wears it, it stays nice and powdery the way it should, okay? And it's really fantastic at preventing friction within the socket. It helps with sweat management. I use it on my runners, my amputee runners. Um, anybody in Florida, because we're always sweaty here. Um, I know, Greg, you like to use it on your crazy long hikes. Right, that's right. And the one thing the, that it really does is kills bacteria and kills any fungal um, bacteria in your socket. So um, that can create some serious havoc on your skin quickly. So uh, not only does it, you know, stop sweat and stop friction, but we're killing bacteria. So that right there, and, and, and the daily moisturizer does this as well. So those two products are, are hands down. Well, I love them all that they, they are the two, you know, primary products that I use because when I'm, I just don't have skin breakdown issues. And, and, and for your sound fit, I've got, like I said earlier, I have a patient that had issues with athlete's foot. He doesn't have these issues anymore because it's killing that fungal bacteria. Um, so really great products. Um, try them, everyone. So. All right. And we have our winner, Connie. Connie's our winner this evening. Oh, my goodness. Connie, after the show is awesome. done, please send me your address, Connie. Um, so that we can send you your four part skincare system. Teresa says, been using it since it awesome. came out. Great stuff. It is, guys. Awesome. It, it really it is. It's a game changer. <laughs> it really game is. changer. All right, guys. With that being said, I am talked out. And that takes a lot. It takes a lot to talk out a Cuban. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I am talked awesome. out, Greg. As always, it is a pleasure to have you as as my co-host on this show. So thank you so much for joining me this evening. Oh, Cozy, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me again. And thanks to everybody who uh, put in some fantastic questions and, and scenarios because we learn daily uh, as practitioners and PTs. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Cozy. And thanks, Vital Fit, for doing it. Yeah. Thank you. And Jamie posted there the code. Again, and guys, if you use the code COSI, C-O-S-I, 10, you get $10 off. I'm a mom of four, so I'm all about the coupons. This is a good one for you guys. Yeah, Johnny, this was a long show because y'all have awesome comments. Yeah. This is a hot topic. Guys, yeah. share this show out. Um, this is an organic show in the sense of how I spread the word. So it's all organic. It's up to you guys to help me spread the word about this show. Um, and I'm also, I had to say this, Greg, and you're going to laugh. I have 998 followers on Instagram. I'm not OCD, but that is seriously causing me to have OCD. Can we please get me to a thousand? I have 998 okay. followers. Come on, guys. Go to my Instagram there account, right. please. I know this sounds really sad. 
please follow me on Instagram, Cozy Talks, just so I can get above a thousand because 998, it's, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. I'm going on there right now. So. Thank you. Well, you should already be following me, Greg. All right, guys. <laughs> I think thank I am. But, um, Vital Fit, thank you guys so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed working with the team this year. Um, thank you so much for your support and for, for the support of all my sponsors on this show. Could not do it without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. Um, guys, thank you for letting me be a part, letting us be a part of your lives this evening. And we will see you next week. It'll be a general Q&A session. So give me those questions um, and I'll try to find some answers for you. All right, guys. Awesome. Have a great evening. Good. God bless. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.